cosmology, which is the study of the entire universe from the smallest scales to the largest scales from beginning to end. And, um, and so I, I, it really is like the whole universe is on the table here. So um, I may not know all of the answers, but I will do my best. Um, but I was also asked to give a 10 minute intro uh, presentation, um, which hopefully they will put on the screen shortly. Um, at some point, I have slides. Here we are. Okay, um, so I'm going to try and give an introduction to as much of the universe as I can in ten minutes. Okay. All right. So, all right. So uh, we live in a galaxy. This is a view of the Milky Way uh, on a really clear night in the southern hemisphere. You can tell it's the southern hemisphere because from the south you can see the center of the galaxy there, um, where you have a big whole lot of stars, a sort of bulge of the central uh, supermassive black hole in there. Um, if we were to be outside the galaxy, we could look down on it and it would look something like this. Uh, the sun, we're kind of out there. Um, the, the central bolt has this kind of bar shape, which is really interesting. And then there are these spiral arms. It's a sort of disk. And um, so we live there. Uh, the universe is full of galaxies. Um, this is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. And in this picture, this is, uh, they just took this telescope and just stared at the blankest part of the sky they could find for something like 10 days, uh, you know, 10 sort of orbits or whatever. Um, and uh, in this case, there are, I think about, 15,000 galaxies, if you look, it, like, there's this, it's, this picture goes a little bit larger, but this is most of it. And so in this picture, virtually everything you see here is a galaxy. Um, that's a star, and that one up there is a star, there's like maybe one other. Everything else is a galaxy. That's, that's a galaxy, that's a galaxy, that's a galaxy, that's a weird one, that's a galaxy. So, like, there are um, something like two trillion galaxies in our observable universe. Um, and each of these galaxies has millions or billions of stars. And that is just the icing on the cake, because most of the universe is entirely invisible. Most of every galaxy that you see is actually made of dark matter. Now. I heard y'all are nerds, so uh, I figured I would explain dark matter via something you can relate to. Okay, so we're going to compare dark matter to the force, right? Um, and of course you all know a lot about the force. The force is what gives a Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us it binds the galaxy together. So we will examine each part of that statement um, as it relates to dark matter. Okay, so, gives a Jedi his power. No, um, first of all, dark matter doesn't appear to be connected to uh, the Force in that way, the Jedi powers. Um, also, not all Jedi are male, so clearly that's false. <laughs> It's an energy field. I mean, it's a kind of matter. So it's something that has mass, and there are ways to find it, to you know connect mass and energy, matter and energy. So you can think of it like that. But it's really it's really more mass. It's probably particles um, that that have gravity that have you know mass, and so they, they exert gravity. Um, created by all living things. No, um, living things are made of. Luminous matter, they're made of the particles that we 
deal with all the time, quarks, leptons, um, protons, neutrons, all that kind of thing. Uh, dark matter appears to be something that is not any of those uh, kinds of particles. It seems to be a new kind of particle that has mass, but that, that we can't see. Okay, so it surrounds us. Yes, it does. Um, it uh, appears to be distributed in kind of clumps in the universe with galaxies sort of embedded inside these clumps. It penetrates us, yes, that does appear to be the case. Um, dark matter is something that's invisible, and when something's invisible, that means, in this case, uh, it's something that doesn't interact with the electromagnetic force. So um, electromagnetism is responsible for light, you know, um, so it's invisible, we can't see it, the light passes right through it, it doesn't reflect or absorb light. But when something doesn't interact with electromagnetism, that means you also can't touch it. Because when you touch something, what you're actually doing is you're pressing your electrons against the electrons in the thing that you're trying to touch, and so you don't really touch it, it, it like repels. So that's why things feel solid, and dark matter doesn't seem to do that. It doesn't seem to interact with electromagnetism, so it can just pass right through other matter, and including ourselves. And it is probably passing through us right now in this room. It binds the galaxy together. Yes, it does. <laughs> Dark matter uh, is responsible for most of the mass of the galaxy, of um, apparently all galaxies, and as the galaxy is sort of rotating, the stars are going around the center of the galaxy, um, they, they are going too fast for just the gravity of the stuff we can see to hold them in. There has to be some extra gravity holding them into the galaxy. So dark matter does indeed bind the galaxy together. So when you see a picture of a galaxy like this, um, you have to keep in mind that this is, just, this is just a sort of tiny bit of the galaxy, and really you should envision it something more like this, where um, the galaxy is embedded in this sort of cloud, we call it a halo of dark matter. Okay, now, um, a lot of times when I talk about dark matter, people ask me, well, what about dark energy? Because it is a different thing. So, <laughs> so I, will, I will tell you the difference. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what dark energy is. Um, so I mentioned that there are galaxies in the universe. And when we look out at other galaxies in the universe, we see that galaxies are moving apart from each other over time. Um, everything appears to be moving away from us, if it's far enough away from right now, but also other galaxies are moving away from each other. The universe is expanding, and the way that expansion works, individual galaxies are not expanding, but the space in between them is expanding. And in the 1990s, astronomers were trying to figure out how this expansion was going to go in the future, because the idea is, okay, you know, we started expanding at the Big Bang, and the expansion has been going on, but as expansion happens, the gravity between these galaxies is trying to kind of slow down the expansion, it's trying to pull everything back together. And so the question was, which one of these things is going to win? Is it going to be the expansion is going to win, and we'll keep expanding forever, or will the gravity win and bring us back to like a big crunch at the end? Um, and so they were trying to figure out how much the gravity of the galaxies was slowing everything down, so they were measuring the deceleration of the universe, how, uh, how quickly the expansion was slowing down. And so they were looking for this number called the deceleration parameter that was going to measure that. And they found that that number was negative because the universe is actually speeding up in its expansion. Um, and that's weird. It's super weird. Um, because there really should only be a couple of ways that it can go when you have uh, something that's kicked off by an initial sort of push um, and then and then it's just kind of moving with with you know the laws of gravity. It's kind of like if I take something and I throw it up into the air. You know there are a couple of things that can happen. Um, I usually what would happen is I throw it up into the air. Um, I'm not very strong, so the 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 uh, uh, gravity of Earth pulls on it and slows down its ascent and so much that eventually it pulls it down and it, and it comes back. Um, if I were to throw it at 11.2 kilometers per second, uh, and we didn't have a roof, um, then, we wouldn't then have it a roof. could reach escape velocity and, uh, and 
leave um, you know the Earth's gravity um, and it, and be you know moving through space, but it would always sort of be you know pulled by the by the Earth's gravity. At best, it would kind of reach a constant speed. Um, what you don't expect to happen is you throw it up into the air, it's slowing down for a little while, and then it just shoots up into space. <laughs> um, but that's what the universe is doing. Uh, and we don't know why, so we figure there's something in the universe that we call dark energy that's making this happen. Um, and unfortunately, one of the things that dark energy is going to do is destroy the universe uh, in the future, one way or another. Uh, the most likely way uh, that it will destroy the universe is that as the universe expands faster and faster, each galaxy gets more and more isolated, um, and eventually, you know, other galaxies are going to be so far away that we won't be able to see them, and there won't be any more like collisions of galaxies, which means you won't get any new stars forming, and the stars that are in our galaxy will burn out and and sort of um, die, and then the the particles will decay, and everything just kind of fades to black. And that's called the heat death. Um, and uh, it's a very sort of melancholy way for the cosmos to go. There are other possibilities, which I could talk about if I had more time, um, and, but you can ask me about them if you'd like. So, okay, that's, uh, that's most of my introduction. Um, just to remind you, uh, dark matter is something that, cre that is, has gravity, so it kind of pulls on things. Um, creates a uh, dense in space-time, if you think about it in the sort of Einsteinian general relativity of the picture, uh, which I can also explain later if need be. Um, and dark energy is something that kind of stretches and pulls space larger, right? So dark matter, dark energy. Okay, we're all good there. Um, now, these are the only things I'm talking about in the introduction because it turns out that I have co now covered 95% of the universe. <laughs> Um, if we make a pie chart of what the universe is made of, something like 27% is dark matter, something like 68% is dark energy, and then there's this tiny 5% slice that is the stuff that we remotely understand. Um, so I've left that part out. <laughs> not missing much. Um, and, uh, and now I will take questions. <laughs> Hi everyone, by the way, I wasn't here in time to properly introduce Katie, so ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Katie Mack. Okay, uh, okay so I, I believe we have, so there, there are mics going around, um, please speak into the mic when you have your question, um, and, uh, and then we'll, I'll do my best. Hi Katie. Hi. So excited to have a scientist on board. Oh, thank you. Well, a scientist on stage on board. Yeah, I'm sure there's, there's, there's plenty of scientists yeah. elsewhere. Um, I've often had the question that we've known that there are the suns go supernova and do all this great stuff. Yeah. Do you know when we first were aware of it actually happening? First aware of like supernovae? Of actually of stars being exploding? able to be able to say, oh look, that star was there and now it went supernova. Uh I mean it goes way back. I don't know um, I don't know the numbers, but um, but there were there were supernovae that were were detected just as like they would see something that looked like a new star in the sky. And that's where that's what Nova uh, that's where, where the word comes from. Um, there is a, a supernova remnant that we uh, talk about in um, in astronomy sometimes called Tycho's supernova because like Tycho Brahe saw it. Um, there are some supernovae that were recorded in like ancient Chinese uh, observations of the sky. Um, so something as a new star in the sky has been uh, seen many times, um, but I don't know when it was figured out that these were actually explosions of, of stars that were already there. I get, to clarify my question, I guess, within my lifetime, mm -hmm. which I'm getting kind of old, um, in my lifetime, have they been able to see that it happened? Because I mean, I Oh, like see a star and then yeah, see it later? Yeah, it's like in the last 15, or 75 years. Oh, sorry, 65. <laughs> turning, turning 65 on Monday. 
Um, so, so, <laughs> don't take the time, please. <laughs> In the last, say, 60 years, has something like this happened? So, there have been tons of supernovae in and I mean, there's there have already been many this year that have been detected. Um, we 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 uh, we give supernovae um, like a, the year and then a, then a letter, and we've had to go to two letters at the end um, to to count them all. Um, so that we see them all the time. It's rare to see a supernova and then know which star it came from. So sometimes you can you can uh, see the supernova happen in the galaxy, figure out. Which, you know, we see them in other galaxies. So we'll see the supernova happen in a galaxy, and then we'll go back and look at older pictures of that same galaxy and try and figure out, like, where the supernova happened. But actually, like, seeing the progenitor star, I think maybe we've, we've managed that, like, a couple of times. But usually we see supernovae in other galaxies, and so it's, you can't see individual stars. The, the nearest one, we've had recently was in 1987, and that was uh, in our, one of the satellite galaxies to our galaxy. Um, we may have we may have identified which star it came from, but I don't, I don't know for sure. We did. Okay, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yes, we did, apparently. Um, uh, the cool thing about that one is that we also caught neutrinos from it, um, mm. and, uh, and that's a whole other story, but it was very neat. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, so, I actually have a follow-up to that one that I've asked uh, Tanya Harrison and Neil Tyson, and they both said, I don't know. So if you say, I don't know, I have a backup question. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a follow-up to that one. Um, as I understand it, our sun is uh, population three. It's the, th it's the third. There was a supernova, and then oh, there was a supernova. Third generation, third generation. Yeah, third generation, right, something, right. Something like that. Um, is all the matter in this room and all, all of us, was it all in a single star at one point in the past, or was it a, several stars that mixed together in a, in a nebula? And that was um, the question that the two of them said they didn't know. So. Okay, so, so I would not expect it to be all in a single star, but also, um, okay, so people say, you know, we are star stuff, right? Like, we're made of, like, the elements in our bodies were formed as stars, which is which is mostly true if you count by mass. Okay, so like our, our heavier elements did were formed as stars because um, you know stars take hydrogen and put it into helium, and then you know larger stars can make higher elements, and then colliding neutron stars can make uh, really heavy elements, and so on. Um, but uh, but if you count by number, we're mostly hydrogen. And that has not been in stars. That was forged in the Big Bang. So we are star stuff, but we're also Big Bang debris. <laughs> a lot of our a lot of our atoms have basically been around, or at least the nuclei have basically been around since since the first like uh, minutes of the universe. Um, so so. What was all the carbon in one star? Um. I, I don't think so. Um, I don't know for sure, but but also some of the really heavier elements were probably formed in different kinds of stars. So if you if you look at what kinds of stars form different elements, they're not all the same kind of star. So uh, there are some elements that are formed mostly in collisions of neutron stars. That's that's then you have two stars already. Um, uh, so that would, so if we have any of those, then then you you already can't have done it in one star. Thanks. I'm just, uh, I'm just going with where the microphones go, so. Yes. Well, yes. okay. uh, so this is a lot closer to home, okay. but we're on a boat in the middle of the Caribbean. There's arguably a lot less light pollution than we're generally used to. Yes. Why can't we see more stars? Uh, I, I... So it might be that the atmospheric conditions are kind of bad for it. Um, so if you don't have, so the things you need to see stars clearly 
there are a few things you need. Um, one is you need your eyes to adjust. So if you just step outside of a building, it's going to be tough. Um, another is that you need not a whole lot of light pollution. And then another is that um, you want the air to be as dry as you can make it. Um, because um, because water vapor in the in the atmosphere kind of messes stuff up, um, and you don't want to have a lot of you know you don't want clouds and stuff like that, of course. Um, but so uh, some of the telescopes that we use for astro astronomical observations, they're generally on top of mountains, um, and they're generally in in dry places as much as possible. Um, so, for example, um, there are a bunch of telescopes in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Um, they're at high altitude and they're in a desert, and it's it's like so dry there that that's that's like one of the big challenges of going there is dealing with the the lack of humidity. And there's like a pool inside the um, inside the like place where the astronomers hang out to keep some kind of moisture in the air um, indoors. Um, I have not been there because I'm a theorist and I don't tend to get to go to telescopes, um, <laughs> but I've heard that it's really lovely. <laughs> So yeah, so so the, it might be just the humidity is, is causing us problems. Hello. Hi. Can you talk about the relationship between uh, black holes and how that might manipulate time? Ooh. Okay. Black holes and time. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to refer to my slides. Um, oops. Sorry, galaxy. Okay. Um, so, so this this picture is uh, this this sort of cartoon is an illustration of Einstein's uh, picture of how matter affects space. Um, so the idea is that if you have a massive object, it creates like a dent in space. It sort of curves space. Um, and in Einstein's picture of, of the universe, space and time are very intricately connected. And so if you have uh, a really, um, if you have something that's really affecting space, it's also going to be affecting time. Um, and other things happen, like if you're moving really quickly, it changes how time is moving. Um, but if you're near a really massive object, time gets weird. Um, specifically, if you're deeper into a sort of space-time dent, a uh, gravitational well, your time, the time, time is going to go slower for you than someone who's outside of it. Um, and so in black holes, this is a sort of extreme situation there. Uh, so if you, get, if you get close to a black hole, um, the time for you gets slower and slower compared to the time for someone else. Now you won't notice the time uh, changing, like you'll, you'll feel just normal. Uh, your time will feel normal. You'll, you'll feel like you're having the right number of heartbeats and all of that kind of thing. Um, but if you tried to measure by something outside of the black hole, it would seem like they're, it seemed like they were moving in like fast forward. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so getting close to black holes messes with your time sense. And once you get past, um, like once you get to the event horizon, which is sort of the boundary, uh, imaginary boundary of a black hole, it's a place where you wouldn't be able to turn around and leave again if you went past that, um, then your time is uh, sort of like infinitely slow compared to something far away. Um, and so, so lots of weird things happen. People will not be able to see you fall past that. Uh, if they're watching from the outside, you'll sort of appear to slow down and kind of get stuck and then fade away um, if they're watching you fall in. But you'll just fall in. Like you won't necessarily notice anything weird happening at the event horizon, um, depending on how you're moving and stuff like that. Um, so there is like if you tried to stand still right past the event horizon, you would die immediately, um, because because uh, once you're past the event horizon, there's only one direction things can go, which is toward the center of the black hole. Um, well, I mean they can go they can go any direction. They can go toward the center of the black hole, or they can go a little sideways toward the center of the black hole. They can't go the other way. So if you're standing right past the event horizon of the black hole, all your blood is going that way. Um, and none of it's going that way. And it's the same with your nerve impulses, so you would just be dead. Um, if you move in really, really quickly, you might be able to, to save yourself for a little bit, but then you end up in the, black, at the center of the black hole a lot faster, and you die there, too. Um, so you should <laughs> definitely not try this at home. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, the mic's over here. 
Hi. Hi. Um, I guess what my question is, are you a fan of science fiction? Yes. And if so, <laughs> what science fiction annoys you the least as a professional? <laughs> So, so, okay, I, I don't tend to get super annoyed by science fiction in general, unless it's just bad writing. Like, you know, I mean, if it's, if, like, I, I judge science fiction in much the same way I judge other kinds of stories um, by, you know, how interesting they are, how the, the character development and the, and the, um, uh, the plot and, and internal consistency and all that. Um, so. I, I appreciate it when a lot of the science is correct. It doesn't have to all be strictly the stuff that we observe in the universe. You can have like a couple of sort of out there things as long as they're consistent and they make sense and they're not like offensively wrong. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm reasonably forgiving, I think, uh, in terms of, um, you know, liberties taken with science in, in science fiction. Um, uh, and I have many favorites, um, and uh, I will not. I will not try and choose between them uh, on a stage right now. <laughs> Safe. Safe. Actually, kind of a follow up on the science fiction. <laughs> what science do you think that science fiction is really missing out on? What would you like to see more stories mm -hmm. tapping into? Interesting. Uh, gosh. You mean, like, just specifically in terms of astrophysics and things like that? Um, I mean, I, I think that, uh, that more stories should deal with relativistic effects um, if you're traveling really fast, because those are just cool. Uh, and you get really interesting sort of uh, situations where you know you have some some of your characters are moving really fast and some are not, and then their time doesn't sync up anymore, and that's kind of interesting. Um, some people do deal with that very well, um, but uh, but it's not that often invoked. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's a hard that's a hard question and an interesting question. I might have to think about that for a while. Okay. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you so much for being here today. That's it's totally happy. fascinating. I have two completely unrelated questions. Okay. okay. All right. It's, because you know I got microphone, I want to ask all of them. Right. So two, two completely unrelated. So the first question is: Okay, so Big Bang, massive amount of energy, so the particles, and then there's a, a matter, antimatter, right? And classically, matter, antimatter meet and new and get consumed and energy produced, right? Mm -hmm. And then, well, and then there would be nothing left other than just energy, yet we do have objects and matter and so forth. Yes. So, was it, was it actually the case of some anomalies where for a certain number of particles there was an anomaly of so, some kind of asymmetry, or is it they just flew away so fast that they haven't met and once they meet they will actually collide and uh, disappear? So. And that's purely a um, perfect question for a theoretician, right? So that's the first question. And the second question is also for a theoretician. You know, um, in the special theory of relativity, we study the Lorentz transformation equations and when, when 1 minus v over c squared, right, in the square root. So as, as a theoretician, speaking of science fiction, what actually would be happening to those equations? What would be the mean? the meaning of that, the new imagination, if the speed was higher than the speed of light? Okay, uh, I'll answer the second question first. Um, uh, we, uh, so causality is this idea that, uh, that information can't travel faster than the speed of light. As soon as information travels faster than the speed of light, causality is broken, um, and then, then time travel is technically possible. Um, so, so if you could have something that traveled faster than the speed of light, um, it would screw up causality and um, and then you know then you can have backward time travel and all of that kind of thing. Um, the other question is about something called baryogenesis, um, which is whatever, which is this um, how you get uh, how, like yeah. So the idea is that yes, initially there should have been the same amount of matter and antimatter, um, so they should have completely annihilated. They didn't. 
we have more matter than antimatter by a lot now um, in the observable universe. The the way that uh, the way that we usually figure that happened is something something was weird in the early universe to make to change the balance to make to make an asymmetry between matter and antimatter such that we ended up with more regular matter and much less antimatter. Um, there, there's no reason to think that the two would be separated spatially. Um, so there's no particularly good reason to think that there should be like regions of space that are dominated by antimatter. Um, it appears that the whole observable universe is basically the same. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything weird in any particular direction um, or at any particular distance. Um, the universe appears very, very homogeneous. So uh, we don't think that there are like regions of antimatter that somehow escaped annihilation. Uh, where's the mic? Okay, over there. Whatever dark matter turns out to be, yes. do you think it's something that fits in the standard model, or is no. there new physics there? Yes. Um, <laughs> it, it, it really. It would be really, really hard to get dark matter to fit into the standard model. None of the... So the standard model of particle physics is this fantastically successful um, uh, sort of framework where all of the particles we've ever detected in an experiment fit into this, this model of how particles work in, in particle physics. All of the forces of nature that we know about fit into the same picture. Um, and it's called the standard model, but it doesn't um, have any room for dark matter or dark energy. There are no particles in the standard model that have the properties that dark matter needs to have to be the, the sort of dominant stuff in the universe, or the dominant matter of the universe. Um, there's nothing in the standard model of particle physics that could explain dark energy um, either. So, um, and, and then there's, there's stuff that happened in the early universe, or that we think happened in the early universe, that doesn't seem to fit into the standard model either. So we have very good um, evidence that there has to be something beyond that, 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 um, that there has to be some other sort of theory that includes more kinds of stuff than what we can detect in our experiments right now, um, and that includes dark matter. There, there are ways that you can try to fit it in by um, by having sort of very strange things happen in the early universe uh, before all the measurements we have that tell us how many regular particles there are versus uh, dark matter. But um, they would invoke sort of even weirder physics that would have to be beyond the standard model too. Um, so generally speaking, like none of the particles in the standard picture of the standard model of particle physics could be the dark matter. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm not sure if this is an astrophysics question, but I think it is. Okay. Um, I want to know if you think that, or if, I want to know if time is sort of a regular dimension like the other ones, such that the future actually exists in some sense, and we just can't see it because of entropy or whatever, yeah. or if it's really special and that the future doesn't exist and is actually being created. I can't say that in English, but... Yeah, yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, yeah, this could be a really long conversation because it's a fascinating topic. Um, uh, so there's this idea called the block universe, which is where, um, like, you have the three dimensions of space and the one dimension of time, and you can envision this as, like, just a giant block of space-time. And so we exist at one point in that block right now, um, and things that are in our future in a different part, different parts of that of the block. Um, but in some sense, they all exist now. Um, and you, one of the reasons that that's a reasonable thing to think about is that if you're traveling in a different way, or if you're in a different part of the universe, um, you will see f things that are in our future before we will. Um, or you know, you'll see things happen at different times. So one of the things that happens if you're moving really, really fast in relativity is that simultaneity gets broken. So somebody moving really fast past us in a rocket might see two things happen and think that thing A happened before thing B, and that we would think thing B happened before thing A because of the way that the light is getting to us and, and all of that, this relativistic, these relativistic effects. Um, and so in some ways of thinking, that only makes sense if all of that is already written, because then you know 
it, you can figure, you know, that they're getting the information before we are, and so it has to already be there before we get it. Um, but then there are other ways of thinking about it where, um, you know, you just can't really talk about uh, things that we don't, that we don't have, uh, that we haven't got the information for yet. And so it's it kind of like, that information doesn't exist until, we, until it gets to us, even if it gets to somebody else first, because we don't observe the other person getting the information until that information gets to us. So, so there's a whole, you can get into very deep, uh, you know, sort of philosophical discussions that involve things like free will, um, uh, and I, I, I won't get into that. But, um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, time is a really interesting dimension because we can only travel in one direction in it, um, and and it's special because it has that directionality, and, and that directionality appears to be connected to uh, the idea of entropy. So there's this the second law of thermodynamics says that. Um, that basically disorder grows over time, um, and and so time is the direction in which disorder is growing, more or less, and uh, and so that like that sets the direction in which the, in a way that other dimensions don't have a direction. Um, and one of the cool things about the heat death that I talked about as a way for the universe to end is that heat death is when we reach the maximum entropy state of the universe. Um, and once you're at the maximum entropy state, you can't have entropy increasing anymore. And so in some sense, the direction of time no longer exists. So time becomes meaningless, which is a really cool concept. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> every conversation with me gets back to the end of the universe at some point because, because I'm writing this book and so it's just super on my mind, which is probably not healthy, but it's not. Okay, uh, where's the next, uh, oh, over here. Hi, thanks. Hi. Um, something that's always confused me as a, a non-scientist but an avid consumer of, of science fiction is that, uh, taking us back to black holes, okay. the old nothing can ever escape. Yes. What about pulsars and quasars? How does that happen? Ooh, good question. Okay, so, um, okay, so pulsars, uh, so pulsars are, are not technically part of this the same picture because a pulsar is a spinning neutron star and a neutron star is not as dense as a black hole so it doesn't have an event horizon. Um, but pulsars are things where the magnetic fields uh, that they have accelerate these giant jets that shoot out from them. Uh, quasars um, are um, things that also have sort of giant jets of energy shooting out of them um, but they seem to be powered by supermassive black holes. And so that sounds like a contradiction, right? Because nothing can come out of a black hole but yet we see these supermassive black holes with these giant jets. And what's happening there is that the black hole is this tiny thing in the center of the galaxy, and there's a disk of, of matter um, around the black hole falling in, like a whirlpool. Um, and as that matter is falling in, uh, it's colliding, it's heating up, it's emitting x-rays and all this stuff, and there's a magnetic field associated with that. And so the mag there's a magnetic field um, that gets twisted up by this, this stuff falling in, and that creates a jet that, that shoots particles out. Um, exactly how that works in terms of like the magnitude hydrodynamics of it is still actually being worked out in some ways. But the way that the way that we understand it is that the, the, the twisted of magnetic fields can accelerate particles um, and shoot them off in space. And you can have uh, galaxies where there's a galaxy with a, a supermassive black hole in the center. Um, and uh, that supermassive black hole is pulling in matter, it creates this disk, and it creates these jets, and those jets can go like thousands of light years uh, beyond the galaxy. They can be accelerated out into space. So basically, you just have this extremely powerful engine driving um, the, the sort of um, twisting of those magnetic fields by pulling in the stuff, and then you get these extremely powerful jets. So it appears that stuff is coming out of the black holes, but it's actually just coming out of the vicinity of the black holes, and it's driven by the pulling um, of, of that black hole. Yeah, over here. Oh, uh, sorry, there and then here. Yes. Hi. Hi. In your initial presentation, you mentioned <laughs> the heat death of the universe yes. as one of the possible ways that the universe could evolve. Yes. Could you tell us about some of the other possibilities? Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the book that I'm writing right now, called The End of Everything, 
Um, uh, we'll cover five different ways for the universe to end. Um, so heat death seems to be the most likely one. Um, the big crunch that I talked about, if we didn't have dark energy, um, that seems unlikely because dark energy is making the universe expand faster and faster. But um, if if dark energy, which we don't understand, somehow turned around, like changed sign, um, if it evolved over time, it could end up pulling things back. Um, and so then you could still have a big crunch. Um, probably a very long time from now, but it's, it's a possibility. Uh, then there's the big rip, which is a really fun one. Uh, so the big rip is where dark energy kind of gets really, really powerful and starts uh, pulling the universe apart faster and faster and, and, and starts pulling actual galaxies apart, not just moving galaxies apart from each other, but pulling them apart from the inside. And then it destroys solar systems, and then it destroys planets and, and atoms, and then just rips the whole of space asunder. It's really cool. Um, and then if, if, we can, if we can measure how dark energy is changing over time or, or like what, what it's doing, we, we could actually predict like a date for that event, which would be fun. Um, the, at the moment, um, the, the, the earliest date to, uh, consistent with the data is like 120 billion years from now, so probably don't have to worry about that yet. Um, then there's vacuum decay, which technically could happen at any moment, which is really fun. Uh, so this is where, it's a complicated story, but basically like something happens with the Higgs field that creates this bubble of like a new kind of space and that bubble expands out at the speed of light and destroys everything and then that space collapses in, in, into like a big crunch um, and just the whole universe is wiped out and you don't even notice because it happens at the speed of light so you don't see it coming, you don't feel it uh, nobody misses you, it's just, you know, so it's, it's, it's a very humane but it goes in sense um, and then there are a couple of models where you have like cyclic universes where like there's, there's one where you have like two parallel universes sort of and they can collide with each other and create like a new big bang when they collide um but that's a longer story um okay i have, I have to take just one more question because i'm running out of time so or i'll take one more after this one and then we'll stop okay yes. you got into the uh, time dilation relativistic yes. stuff like that yes and if you're looking at a moving object from one reference frame time slows down for them yeah but couldn't you look at your reference frame from that, and yes. when that slowed down. So, how do you wrap your head around the fact that you're both? <laughs> um, yeah, this is this is the principle of relativity. This is why it's called relativity because motion is relative, and and you know it does look like if I'm moving in a rocket ship um, past a stationary thing, it'll look to me like their time is going slow, like they're moving really fast because they seem to be moving fast in that direction. Um, and, and that's, that ends up um, creating all sorts of problems like the twin paradox. Um, so yeah, so the way you reconcile it is um, as long as people are just moving in sort of straight lines, then, then it doesn't matter because you can't really like, you, you can't stop and compare clocks. Um, so it'll look to me like that person's time is going really slowly and they'll, it all looks to them like my time is going slowly, but until we stop and turn around and come back, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, in, in some real sense. So, so it's not until you actually stop and compare clocks that you actually resolve those paradoxes. Um, or until you, like, one person turns around and the other doesn't, or something like that. Uh, so, so yeah, you get, but you get all sorts of really weird paradoxes um, in, in relativity. It's really fun when you start studying that and, and uh, you have these little brain explosions every day. So okay, I think last question uh, there. I have a couple questions that are related to dark matter and dark energy, hopefully we're closely related. Okay. One is, um, and I'm curious if these have been debunked or possible to be explored, is okay. um, if space-time itself has a weight and that's perhaps the source of dark matter. Um, and the other one is if there is, perhaps related to that, the whatever is not out, is outside of that bubble of dark matter that you illustrated before. If light dilates different, and that gives an illusion of the acceleration. Like it. Okay, so uh, I'll answer the second question first. Um, uh, there, there was for a while uh, this idea um, that people floated called the tired light um, the hypothesis that just said that it's not that that things are moving away from us faster. It's just that light like reduces in 
wavelength in, in frequency and intensity on its own over like as it goes farther, um, and that doesn't fit the observations. So so that that idea is discarded. There are a couple of ways where we see that the universe really does appear to be accelerating. Like it's that's the only thing that's consistent with the data that acceleration is actually happening. Um, the question about dark matter. Um, I mean, what what we call mass is something that bends space-time. Um, space-time itself doesn't have uh, properties like like weight. It's more a sort of um, it's more like a flexible grid system. So uh, so we we like we have an equivalence between the curvature of space-time and, and mass. Um, and, and those things are connected. And so if, if something causes a lot of curvature in space-time, we say that thing is massive. Um, and if it doesn't, then it's, then it's not. And so, so assigning something to space itself doesn't really fit into that picture in any way that, that, um, that sort of works. Um, there, there are ways people have tried to sort of increase the, like, say you have some, some object where you know its mass because it's, it's a luminous object and you, you know what those things weigh. Um, people have tried to like just say, well, what if we just dial up the, the mass of that thing and then say that's the dark matter? Um, but that doesn't work either um, because it has to be something that, that really does like pass through other matter and the way that it, it um, collects around galaxies is like, the galaxy is a disk, the dark matter is more of a sphere, spherical blob and that only works if you have this like collisionless uh, matter that can pass through other stuff. And so it, it's much more consistent with just some kind of stuff that doesn't like to interact via electromagnetism than, than really any other hypothesis that's, that's been floated. Um, so um, I'm at negative four minutes, so I think I have to stop. Um, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>